Sergeants, uh, will you begin recording? PC started. Thank you. Cloud started. Thank you. Back, back up is rolling. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. Welcome to the New York City Council remote hearing on the subcommittee on zoning and franchises. At this time, all panelists, please turn on your videos. Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. I repeat, land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Moya, we're ready to begin. Thank you. Thank you to the Sergeant at Arms. Uh, good morning. I'm Council Member Francisco Moya, Chair of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises, and I'm joined remotely today by Council Members Borelli, Ayala, uh, uh, Rivera, and Gridencek. Uh, today, uh, we will hold public hearings on the uh, St. Joseph's 1949 Bathgate Avenue rezoning proposal in the Bronx and the proposed West 16th Street Special Permit in Brooklyn. Uh, but first we will vote on the crab shanty i'm sorry uh crab shanty and castle hill items which will be heard by the subcommittee at which was heard at our subcommittee uh back in uh, may 19th we will vote to approve with modifications lu 790 and 791 for the 909 castle hill avenue rezoning relating to property in council member ruben diaz seniors district in the bronx the proposal seeks a zoning map and zoning text amendment, including changing an R32 district to an R6B district with a partial C13 overlay and the establishment of a mandatory inclusionary housing area mapping option one and option two to facilitate the development of a five-story mixed-use building, including approximately 35 dwelling units, nine of which would be permanently affordable, as well as commercial and community facility space. Our modification will be to strike MIH option two while retaining option one. Council member Diaz Sr. is in support of the proposal as modified. We will also vote to approve pre-considered L pre-considered LU 797 for the Crab Shanty 361 City Island Avenue rezoning relating to property in Council Member Jonai's district in the Bronx. The proposal for the Crab Shanty seeks a zoning map amendment to establish a C12 commercial overlay district within an existing R3A district, which would bring the Crab Shanty restaurant and its long-standing commercial use into conformance with zoning. Council Member Jonai is in support of the proposal. Um, now I'm going to check with our council to see if there's any members that would like to speak on those two items. No chair, I see no members with uh, hands raised or comments. Okay. Um, I now call for a vote to approve LU 797 for the Crab Shanty 361 City Island Avenue proposal and to approve with modifications. Uh, I have described LU 790 and 791 for the 909 Castle Hill Avenue rezoning proposal. Uh, Council, if you could uh, please call the roll. Chair Moya. I vote aye. Council Member Gordenchik. Aye. Council Member Ayala. Aye. Council Member Rivera. Aye. Council Member Borelli. Aye. Chair, uh, the vote on the land use items is currently five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. We will keep the vote open. Hey, Council, this is Council Member Antonio Reynoso, uh, available for the vote. On uh, a continuing vote of the land use items, Council Member Reynoso. I'll vote aye on all, um, and I apologize. I was running late as I was reading this book. Uh, uh, revolutionary Staten Island from colonial calamities uh, to reluctant rebels uh, by this great person called Joe Borelli. She got you guys should look at it on Amazon. I don't know Thank about you. great Antonio. <laughs> great, like, like Joe, but let's not go crazy there. <laughs> uh, Chair, the vote is currently six in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. The vote will remain open. 
Okay, great. Okay, um, so before we turn to our hearings, uh, I will first recognize the subcommittee council to review the remote meeting procedures. Thank you, Chair Moya. I am Arthur Ha, counsel to this subcommittee. Members of the public wishing to testify were asked to register for today's hearings. If you wish to testify and have not already registered, we ask that you please do so now by visiting the New York City Council website at www.council.nyc.gov. Members of the public may also view a live stream broadcast of this meeting at the Council's website. As a technical note for the benefit of the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of any of the presentations shown today, please send an email request to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. When called to testify, individuals appearing before the subcommittee will remain muted until recognized by the chair's seat. Applicant teams will be recognized as a group and called first, followed by members of the public. When the chair recognizes you, your microphone will be unmuted. Please take a moment to check your device and confirm that your mic is on before you begin speaking. Public testimony would be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider, or if you wish to submit written testimony instead of appearing before the subcommittee, you may email it to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number and or project name in the subject line of your email. During the hearing, council members with questions should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear at the bottom of your participant panel or at the bottom of your primary viewing window. Council members with questions will be announced in order as they raise their hands, and Chair Moya will then recognize members to speak. Witnesses are requested to remain in the meeting until excused by the chair as council members may have questions. Finally, there will be pauses over the course of this meeting for various technical reasons, and we ask that you please be patient as we work through any issues. Chair Moya will now continue with today's agenda items. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, I now open the public hearing on LU 792 for the West 16th Street proposal requesting a zoning special permit and relating to property in Council Member Traeger's district in Brooklyn. Uh, I will remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to testify on this item. If you have not already done so, you must register online in advance and you may do that now by visiting the Council's website. Um, Council, if you could, uh, please call the first panel for this item. The applicant panel includes Eric Palanik, Land Use Counsel for the Applicant, DJ Banks as the applicant, and David Morais as the project architect. Panelists, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin to speak. Panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yes. I do. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, when you're ready uh, to have your presentation shown on screen, please uh, say so, and it will be shared and displayed by our staff, and the slides will be advanced for you when you say next. As a technical note for the benefit of the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of this presentation, please send an email request to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, and now if the panelists would please restate your names, organizations for the record, uh, you may be. Good morning. My name is Eric Palatnik. I am an attorney representing Bedford Carp, which is the applicant. And DJ, you can introduce yourself, and Roger, you can introduce yourselves. Good morning. This is DJ Banks, Bedford Carp Construction. Hi, good morning. This is David Morais. I am from uh, Joseph Morais Architect's office. Uh, I am filling in um, for my brother, Roger Morais, who is actually the lead architect on this. Uh, he just had a baby two days ago, so he was unable to attend today. So I'm here to answer questions uh, when I can, but I think Eric will uh, you know, lead everything. Thank you, and congratulations to your brother and your family. Yeah, you. Uh, if you may pull up the slide, please, the slides. Thank you very much for hearing us today. My name is Eric Palatnik. Uh, there is some background noise. If somebody can mute themselves, I'm not sure if anybody else can hear that as well. 
Uh, I don't know if you have control over that, uh, Mr. Lassiter. Uh, so thank you, that's a little better. Uh, we're here today uh, for this block of West 16th Street for a 5,500 square foot lot, which you could see there, which is up against an auto zone. Uh, and the site is 5,500 square feet in an M12 zoning district in the special Coney Island mixed use district. Uh, it rests within the confines of community board 13 and it also falls within the district of Councilman Traeger. The reason we are here for you to meet with you today is to request your permission to build a two-story warehouse type contractors establishment for Bedford Carp that'll be about 9,000 square feet, 9,956 square feet, and it'll be two stories. The action we're making is an application pursuant to section 106-32A of the zoning resolution. That's a quirky section of the zoning that says that in the special Coney Island mixed use district, which this falls within, that you cannot have a manufacturing use or a, a warehouse use of the type that we're proposing here without first securing approval from the city planning commission through a special permit. So just to digest that for a second, in a manufacturing district in M12 in New York City, you cannot have a permitted use that would be allowed in most manufacturing districts uh, without first obtaining a special permit. I think the intent many years ago was well placed. Uh, as I take you deeper through this application, you can see the result it's had on this block. But nonetheless, we are here under that section and we need the findings. Uh, and I'd like to present the findings to you. The findings require that the use is permitted that we're proposing, which is a, uh, I'll let David propose it, but to use group 16 use, uh, we could have a commercial or an M use provided that we show that we meet the performance standards in the manufacturing districts, uh, that there will be not be uh, any negative uh, truck traffic generated. And we have a letter from a traffic consultant to support that. And that the uh, proposed use uh, does not displace or uh, preempt anything which is essential to the functioning or growth of residents and residences in the area. So we'll go through this application in a minute. And I'll show you how we meet the findings. Uh, next slide, please. This gives you a summary of what we are proposing, which is, as I said a moment ago, section 106-32A, which is in the top left corner, uh, to allow use group 16D uh, use. Uh, the existing conditions I outlined a moment ago is a 5,500 square foot lot in M12 district within the confines of community district 13, as well as Councilman Traeger's district. Uh, the proposed conditions are in the top right. That's a two-story proposed warehouse on what is now a vacant piece of land. Uh, it'll be about 10,000 square feet. There'll be two stories, which uh, totals uh, a total height of 45 feet. And we'll show you that. It's with, located within a flood zone and it'll have a loading berth. I'll also show you throughout the application that we have made an agreement with the community board and the councilman's office, which you submitted a letter in writing, agreeing uh, that DJ Banks, which the applicant, uh, will not do any construction during the summer months, because it's very important uh, that the traffic not be disrupted at all for the beach traffic. And I'll show you that as we go through it. We've also made a commitment to local hiring with minority women-owned business enterprises, as well as with a number of unions, which we already work in conjunction with as a part of many projects. Uh, next slide, please. As I'm presenting to you, next slide, please. Next slide, please. This will situate you probably fairly clearly as far as to where we are. Coney Island Creek is, of course, in the top right. The auto zone I mentioned is right next to us there. You can see it. Uh, West 16th is a one-way road leading in a southerly direction towards the ocean. Uh, the concerns that were brought up at the community board were the Cropsey Avenue, and you can see Hart Place at the top there. Hart Place is sometimes taken as a shortcut for folks to get around Cropsey Avenue and to get to the beach, and they will go down West 16th Street. Uh, additionally, we've been alerted to the fact that you can see West 16th Street has quite a character to it, which is kind of a, 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 a mixture of uh, vacant lots and uh, car uses and uh, underutilized properties and uh, older uh, older properties, but that block is one way and trucks sometimes double park on that block. So we have been asked to uh, do our best to not to park any trucks. What we're asking you for, by the way, I should mention, is for DJ Banks to have uh, their infrastructure, one of their facilities located here. What they do is they build out the infrastructure for the city and the state 
under contracts on the roadways. They build the retaining walls. They build the terrain that you see. Uh, they build guardrails. They build roadways. So they do that all over the city of New York under contract. As a result, they like to have quote unquote depots around the city where they keep supplies. Uh, it's not necessarily active 24 seven. It's not active 24 seven at all. It's only active nine to five and it's active during the days that they're busy. They'll take in deliveries. They control the trucks that come in and they'll keep their supplies there. And then when people need goods or, the, or materials, I should say, for the road projects they're working on in this part of Brooklyn, they will come to the site at a scheduled time. A pickup truck or a utility truck will come or, or a truck that's bigger if need be, but not 18 wheelers. And they'll pick up what they need. Uh, and and uh, they're on the phone right now. They could explain in greater detail in a second. As you look through this map that I put in front of you, though, here, you can see the host of uses that are around us. Uh, you can see that there's vacant land, there's parking, uh, there's a lot of parking, there's auto body, uh, there's uh, rather a mix of use, as well as some residential. The residential that's there, I'll caution, uh, is not all active residential. Some of it is dormant. Uh, next slide, please. This gives you an indication of where the property is. I'll take you in deeper in a second. Next slide, please. This shows you the tax lot at issue, which is lot 74, so you've already seen. Next slide, please. And you just skip two slides, actually, and that'll take them to show everybody where, there you go, that's perfect. Uh, we are in a flood zone. We're in a flood uh, area V. Uh, you will see a door on the renderings that I'm going to present to you in a few moments to show a door elevated to address the flood zone. That's to address any potential extreme flooding that could occur. There's an exit egress door, uh, which we'll see, which uh, looks rather, uh, if you weren't aware of what it was for, that's what it seeks to address. Next slide, please. I'll take you to the street that we're on. The street, this is the site in the top left corner that you're looking at. And this is uh, why I'm, I'm presenting to you today. I hope something you'll see is a, a significant improvement to the area. Uh, due to the location within the special Coney Island mixed use district, any vacant site that tries to apply for an as of right use has to go through this process. We are three years into this process right now, culminating hopefully soon with your support, we would hope. Uh, that's to take this vacant lot, uh, which cannot be developed upon without your approval and build what we would like to build, which is a two-story contractor type establishment. Uh, if you go pan around, you can see the auto zone uh, is a rather sharp looking building to our right, but we get we get the backside of it. And then you can see the remainder of the street. Go to the next slide, please. And then go to the next slide, please. This is just giving you a perspective of the block front. Now from taking into the plans. Right here, we're showing you what we would like to build. We're requesting your permission to build the building that you see. Oh, you were good right there, but that's okay there too. The two-story contract is established when you see right there. Next slide, please. This is the proposed bulk or massing of the building. There's not much to it. Uh, it's not uh, It's not anything I think that would win any sort of architectural awards, although it will be built using very nice facing materials that will mimic what you see next door with the uh, backside of the auto zone. Uh, and the height that you're seeing is also partly a result, of course, of the flood zone requirements as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the building statistics, uh, but the most important zoning calculation I could show you here is if you look at the grade uh, area in the middle, it's representing the proposed building. You'll see the second floor at the rear does step back by about 20 feet. So the building will be sitting lot line to lot line, except for the second floor rear where there's a setback of 20 feet. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, next slide, please. This is the interior, but there's a better one for you. Next slide. There you go. That's much better. This was created at the request of the community board. Uh, this shows you an illustrative plan to show you what the building would look like fitted out inside. Uh, the bottom is the lower level, the top is the second floor. The idea simply, as I suggested a moment ago, is they have sites that they do construction on the street systems and other infrastructure. Uh, they are a union shop, they're minority, they have minority women owned, a uh, minority women participants, not minority women owned, and they are an union operated shop. Uh, I will let my clients speak to you in greater depth about which unions they have, but there's the Teamsters for trucking, there's the Teamsters for delivery, and there are the engineers, Local 15. Uh, going back to the site, what you see here is where all of these uh, union members will be bringing trucks into the site 
into the building, the overhead door will be uh, rolled down. There will be no offloading on the street, no disruption to the street system. Uh, they don't take out that many trucks at the same time. They control all of their deliveries in and all of their deliveries out. This is them distributing materials to the, the sites. Uh, so you see two 18-foot flatbed trucks could fit inside, and then they could load them up with whatever items they need. Uh, moving to the next slide, I think now... Uh, Oh, I think you're out of my, my slides here. But this is probably as good a part as any to stop, maybe go a few more slides forward, you'll see a rendering, and then we'd be happy to answer any questions anybody may have. If you could find the rendering there, I don't know if you could find it. There you go. So that's a rendered image of the building and the, the surfacing materials and the, the materials development design to accommodate or match the auto zone to our right. Uh, I'd be happy to address any other questions you may have, including our letter to the community board with our commitments. And our architect is here, as is David, as is DJ Banks, who is the uh, proprietor of Bedford Car. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, just a couple of questions here. Um, one, if you could just respond to the Brooklyn Borough President's recommendations uh, on limiting construction to the tourist off season. Yes, we made a, 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 a we gave a letter commitment in writing uh, that we submitted, and um, Mr. Banks is on the phone of Bedford Carp. Uh, they are a New York City based organization. They understand where they are, and they have committed to not building it during the uh, summer season, which would essentially be from our rainy day of yesterday and the day of, uh, this past weekend through Labor Day. Uh, and then they, they would uh, anticipate building during the winter months. It's only about a six month build, so they don't have any problem building from October through uh, April or so to be done. Okay, great. Um... Now, when it comes to local hiring, can you describe your plans uh, for local hiring and construction? and how many uh, local hires would typically be involved in a project like this? Sure, DJ, do you wanna give some information uh, to them sure. about where you do your hiring from? You could probably answer better than I can. There is, uh, well, as you know, we're uh, affiliated with, with just, every in, major. Just having, introduce, having, DJ, just introduce yourself and give your title, please, so they know who you are. I'm DJ Banks, Bedford Carp Construction. I'm the managing partner and vice president. Yeah, you will. Yeah, we're we're affiliated with every major uh, heavy construction union in the city of New York, from operating engineers, which is local fifteen and fourteen, uh, Teamsters for our trucking delivery, local two eighty two, as well as uh, various labor unions, dock builders, carpenters, uh, plumbers, uh, etc. Everything that would would pertain to the heavy construction industry uh, with the sewer and water main construction and road reconstruction as the projects uh, begin to complete. Great. Uh, but my question was um, uh, also, how, how many local hires would typically be involved in a project like this? Um, right now we have uh, all of our uh, crossing guards and our security is hired through a minority business enterprise. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then we hire from uh, different, um, well, they, they're all union, but they are community groups that work within us um, for laborers and, and other skilled trades as well. We have a certain percentage that we have to meet through contract with the city of New York. And, uh, and obviously we, we, we meet those requirements and then some usually exceed it. And in addition, I'll add, uh, we did speak to the councilman and agreed to work with Workforce One Coney Island, the Coney Island office of Workforce One, which is a locally based hiring initiative. So, uh, and he does agree to, to do that and enter into that with the, with the councilman. Okay. Uh, but just if you could at some point get back to me on how many local hires typically would be involved in a project like this. Well, we're, we're going to look to local hiring as far as builders. We're not building construction where we're heavy construction, sewers, water mains, rotary construction, things of that nature. So we would be hiring a building contractor to put this building up for us. Uh, and, okay. and, you know, so we would certainly invite uh, local or minority business enterprises to, to uh, give bid on this project as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. And, and lastly, 
uh, how can we ensure uh, the follow-up and progress report on these commitments? Well, I'm you have clear. To go, go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you first, David. You first, DJ. Well, I mean, needless to say, the project is right now. There's there's another contractor, not ourselves, that is working on another sewer and road reconstruction project on West 16. Um, it would be next to impossible for us to start this project while they're still ongoing, and they're also going to provide us um, when this project, when their project is complete, with the outlet for both the sanitary, the new water main, and the storm sewer as well. So. Our project, our building project, will be delayed until that project is complete and they provide us the outlets for both our sanitary and storm. Um, immediately preceding the uh, final road restoration on West 16th and, of course, out of the Memorial Day Labor Day uh, embargo, uh, we, would, we would start construction in there. And, and, and prior to that, we would begin to advertise for building and, and, and local help to prepare the site and the building going forward. And, and we could also alert the, the councilman who's in place at that time, as I anticipate that could occur after, after the next election. And we could also alert the community board uh, as to when we're doing that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, that's it for questions for me. Um, I also just wanted to acknowledge that we have been joined by council member Traeger and council member uh, Felice. Um, so uh, council, uh, is there any uh, of my colleagues that have any questions for this panel? Chair, I see no members with uh, questions for this panel. Okay. Uh, there being no further questions, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, thank Council, you. Are there any thank you, thank you all for, for being here. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the West 16th uh, the state special permit application? If there are any members of the public who wish to testify on the West 16th Street special permit under LU 792, please press the raise hand button now. The meeting, uh, Chair, the meeting will briefly stand at ease uh, while we check for any newly registered members of the public. Chair Moya, uh, I see no members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Okay, thank you. Um, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on LU 792 for the West 16th Street uh, special permit, the public hearing is now closed and the item is laid over. I uh, now open the public hearing on LUs 806 and 807 for the St. Joseph 1949 Batgate Avenue rezoning proposal, which seeks a zoning map amendment and a related zoning text amendment relating to property in council member Felice's district in the Bronx. Um, once again, uh, if you wish to testify uh, in this meeting, please visit the council's website uh, now to complete the online registration process, or you may also submit written testimony to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, Council, can you please call the first panel for this item? The applicant panel includes uh, Carolyn Harris, Land Use Council for the applicant, Susan Albrecht, Father Eric Cruz uh, for the applicant, and Rachel Simpson as the project architect. We will also have available for Q&A as needed, uh, Father Mike Cassane, Jill Gentile, Shannon Graham-Smith, Harold Moss, Joseph Rosenberg, Johanna Kletter, and Tim Collins. Uh, again, the panel, primary panel will be Carrie Harris, Susan Albrecht, Father Eric Cruz, uh, and Rachel Simpson. Panelists, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin to speak. Thank and you panelists, very much. 
please raise your right hands, panelists. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. Yes. I do. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so just let me read the procedures for all of you. Uh, when you're ready for your slideshow to be displayed, please say so, and it will be shared on screen by our staff. Slides will be advanced for you when you say next. As a reminder for anyone who requires an accessible version of this presentation, please send an email request to testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now if the panelists would please restate uh, your names and organizations for the record, uh, you may begin. Thank you very much, Chair Moya, and uh, to the uh, whole committee. Um, I'm Caroline Harris, partner at Goldman Harris II. We are the Land Use Council for the applicant. And I'm accompanied by um, Susan Albrecht, who's the director of uh, Association of Catholic Homes New York, uh, New York Institute of Human Development. Susan, you want to wave? Um, and Father Eric Cruz, who is, um, I don't know his title other than Father, with, um, with Catholic Homes. Uh, we have uh, Rachel Simpson, the architect from MAP Architects. Rachel, thank you. Uh, and also with us are, is Tim Collins from Rockabill Advisors, who is a financial consultant on the project and available for questions as well. Uh, and part of the presentation, Harold Moss from Beacon of Hope and Shannon Grand Smith, uh, who's with New York Foundling. Is Jill with us too today? Yeah. And Jill, great. And I understand that uh, we are, uh, also fortunate to have Father Kassain here today who uh, can uh, address uh, any questions, but perhaps before Susan, you even uh, jumping into the presentation, if I, either of the fathers would like to say anything immediately, we would welcome your comments. I don't see Father Cruz on the line. I wasn't sure if he made it in, but um, I did want to introduce Father Cassine as the pastor of the merged parish of St. Simon Stock and St. Joseph's. Father, do you want to say a couple words? This is to start. Yes, yeah, just that we've been working on this project for a while, and uh, I'm confident just from knowing the neighborhood and being in the neighborhood that uh, the, uh, the, the building is going to be a very nice building, and uh, it's certainly going to be something that will, will help the area. Uh, and to provide residential housing for people that are, are needy in that. And that's why I know Catholic Charities supports it and I, I know why we want to build a building. We want to find some good use for the property after uh, the church was taken down because of structural uh, problems in that. And uh, this we feel is a good use of the, of the property. Thank, Thank you, Father. So Susan, why don't you uh, start off with describing Catholic Homes and the mission and then I'll come back to discuss uh, uh, the, uh, the land use aspects of the project. So we wanna look at the PowerPoint? Yes, why don't we turn on the PowerPoint? Good idea. Okay. Okay. Great, okay. Um, as uh, Carrie mentioned, I'm Susan Albrecht with the Association of New York Catholic Homes. We're the uh, housing office of Catholic Charities in the Archdiocese of New York. Um, this is a cover sheet that illustrates the project St. Joseph's Apartments, um, and we'll be going through their presentation today on the access and the building bulk. If we can go to the next slide. So our team, as Carrie mentioned, is um, Catholic Homes is the developer. We have MAP Architects. Um, obviously, Carrie uh, from Goldman Harris is working on the land use. Rockabill Advisors is our financial consultant, and our social service providers are the Catholic Charities uh, Community Services Beacon of Hope Program in the New York family. Next slide. Um, so in terms of our mission, uh, Catholic Charities is committed to providing high quality, safe, affordable, supportive housing for families and those in special needs. As you can see here, we have 13 buildings currently with over 2,700 units of affordable housing. Um, this is three photographs of some of the work that we've recently done. The one on the left is Second Farms. 
um, which was up zoned a few years ago and just completed um, its construction and is currently being occupied 319 units. The one in the middle is a St. Augustine apartments, which again was the site of a former pair of St. Augustine. And on the right is a project that we're hoping to break ground on in the next year on the Lower East Side at Clinton Broom. So next slide. So we're gonna to review today the rezoning application to go from R6A to R7D to enable us to create 287 units of low income and supportive housing on the site of the former St. Joseph's Church. Um, again, as we noted, 130 units will be supportive housing to be managed by Beacon of Hope and New York Foundling and 157 units will be for low income families. Again, our, our objectives are to reuse the church site for affordable and supportive housing, develop a building adhering to environmentally responsible and energy efficient design, and just start construction late year, late this year, most probably early next year. Carrie. If you could advance the slides, please. So this is an aerial view of the site and the area around it. The next slide. Um, the project site is on the block uh, bounded by uh, East Tremont, uh, Bath Gate Avenue, East 178th Street, and Washington Avenue. It's on the northern half of the block. Um, it's comprised currently of, of, as you see, four different tax lots. They're all owned by uh, the, will be owned by the developer and consolidated into one tax lot. Um, Move, move ahead, please. Um, the site is existing conditions are that the site has already been, the church has already been demolished and that's the, the demolition site. Uh, next to it to the left in the bottom of the photograph is a three-story parochial school built in 1901. Uh, it's the former police precinct and it's on the National Register. Uh, and on the um, uh, other side of the street is a four-story office building built in 1931, and it is not landmarked. Um, in, the rezoning is going to cover uh, four feet of those properties uh, in order to have the, an even line going across the block uh, and a, a proper distance from a, on a zoning map. Uh, but those buildings are not going to be affected otherwise by the rezoning. Move forward. With, advance the slide, please. So here again, you can see on the zoning map uh, on the left is the current zoning R6A, I highlighted in pink, and we're proposing to change that to R7D, which you can see on the right side. Move forward, please. The existing zoning in the R6A district um, allows residential use up to 3.9 FAR with AIRS otherwise three FAR, and it has a um, maximum building height of 80 feet. What's being proposed today uh, would allow uh, up to 5.6 with heirs and mandatory inclusionary housing with residential uh, use otherwise at 4.2. The primary reason for this rezoning is in order to get the additional FAR and uh, the building height of 110 feet. Um, there had been a, a discussion about why aren't we rezoning it to be the same zoning as on Tremont Avenue, which is a C45X or the equivalent of an R7X. It, that zoning district provides much more height than would be needed for this project because the project is on, uh, on two corners and is able to utilize its floor area at a lower height than the C45X would allow. And uh, so we're very comfortable with the R7D district zoning and the floor area that it affords. If you could move forward, please. Uh, the new building, uh, which is proposed on the right, as you can see, is a much larger building that would be uh, facilitated in comparison to the existing building on the left. Um, We'll be moving forward to describe the building, but just to give you a, a little bit more context about the site, the, the block itself has a very steep slope. It's a 20 foot slope. So the building has been designed with that in mind 
in has two goes has two different heights, which Rachel will explain uh, more about and how that's been incorporated into the design of the building. And the area um, has uh, is transit rich uh, with buses, uh, subway stations near Metro North. There are large parks nearby. And in addition on this project site and in the interior of the site, there will be landscaped area for use of the tenants. Um, so I'd like to turn the presentation over to Rachel uh, from MAP Architects. Hey, Rachel um, Simpson. And if you could advance the slide, please. Thanks, Carrie. Um, uh, what was previously mentioned is that this building will be a mixture of family housing and uh, supportive housing um, administered by both the Beacon of Hope um, organization and New York Foundling. Um, and they have um, several different communities that um, are intended to be served by this building. So we're, we're conceiving of the building as, as one single U-shaped building um, with a single entrance uh, at the ground floor and a shared lobby and amenities at the ground floor, um, above which the building will split programmatically and functionally into two separate wings. Um, one wing for Beacon of Hope and some family housing and the other wing for New York Foundling and family housing, with the idea being that in, in a large building, 287 units is large, and dividing the, the program up into um, smaller wings would allow for um, more community, a sense of uh, a greater sense of community amongst the residents on each floor and in each wing, and also a little more manageable in terms of um, building management and how the services are um, offered in that building. So I believe um, in this corner, you're looking at a rendering of the building from the corner of Bathgate and East 178th Street, looking approximately southwest. Um, and you see here at the corner, um, an, an existing or, or reconstructed rock wall that was part of the original um, uh, form of the, the buildings on site. Um, we're hoping to preserve additional rock from the and granite from the original building to, to repurpose on site in the landscaping and, and some site um, amenities like this. I think we can go to the next slide now. So what we're seeing on this slide are on the left, a site plan showing the general form of the building in the U shape. Um, to the north of, uh, sorry, at the top of the slide, we're seeing Bathgate Avenue, and on the left is um, East 178th Street. So north is to our left here, and at the, at the bottom of the slide is Washington Avenue. So the central entrance is at East 178th Street, and that's to allow us to really tuck the building into that, that big steep slope to minimize some of the, the massing of the building and to take advantage really of, of the, um, the extreme grade change here. Uh, the, the image on the right is an aerial rendering of the opposite corner at East 178th Street and Washington Avenue showing um, the facade articulation, uh, the general building street wall at about seven to eight stories, depending upon the elevation or the, sorry, the street that you're on because of the grade change. Um, and we can go on to the next slide as well. This is showing some typical floor plans. To the left is the first floor plan with the central um, entrance and lobby, shared lobby at the join part, the short um, leg of the U, uh, which leads to a shared courtyard, um, landscaped courtyard that's accessible by um, all residents and um, inclusionary design to allow for various um, uh, gathering and programming aspects there. And we have some slides later on to show you a little bit more of that. At this first floor, we also have both um, office suites for the supportive housing, um, the supportive service providers, accessible to easily accessible off the lobby for for all residents to use. We also have some amenities at the ground floor, including laundry, uh, community rooms, meeting rooms, recreation rooms, and some um, some support for the uh, for the supportive service uh, providers. On the right is a typical floor plan showing then above that ground floor, the two wings split off of this elevator lobby. Each wing has its own stair and elevator core um, and its own you know, support amenities, um, but shared building services. And I believe we can go then to the next slide. This is a, gr a ground view rendering from uh, Washington Avenue at East 178th Street showing um, a very transparent um, street 
uh, condition into the supportive service offices. This is looking into the Beacon of Hope offices. Um, and a very well lit um, path for folks walking along Washington Avenue onto East 178th Street to the building entrance to make it very safe and well lit and active. We can go to the next slide also. Uh, this is a street view from um, East 178th Street showing the main entrance and you can see actually the very extreme uh, grade change here from uh, Bathgate down to Washington Avenue. Um, to the right of the slide, you have a breakdown of the units showing um, studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and three bedrooms, a mix of um, family housing and the supportive units for a total of 287. And I believe the next slide does show a little bit of the AMI, which I will defer to Susan to speak more on briefly. Okay, sure. So we're anticipating uh, financing through the state HFA for tax exempt bonds and tax credits. Um, and then we'll also be looking for supportive service funding through, uh, which has already been awarded through the Empire State Supportive Housing Initiative, ESHI. Um, but this is just an example of the projected rent ranges that we're looking at right now for the family units. Next slide. And I believe the next few slides are just some images of the proposed uh, rent, uh, landscaped courtyard. I think we can all agree after the last year how important outdoor space is to well-being and health um, and community. Um, and so as an amenity, we'd like to offer uh, for the residents, all of the residents, you know, various options for small group or, or larger group outdoor space. Um, this is a, a site plan of that courtyard. And I think the next slide does have a rendering of that. We can move to the next slide. Correct, this is a rendering looking from the open end of the U shape of the building back towards the shared um, lobby and the elevator lobbies that you would see at each floor, which provide a lot of transparency through the building into the courtyard and, uh, and, and a really a lovely amenity for community space for the residents. And is this, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Carrie. No, I was gonna say that we, would, we could advance to the next slide and I'd pick up from here. So we, uh, we are, as you know, nearing the end of ULERP. We were very uh, uh, grateful to get, really grateful to get a, a unanimous community board support from community board six and support from the borough president with uh, glowing recommendations. As a land use attorney, it was pretty gratifying to see, to hear the support that we got from both. Um, and uh, I wanted to acknowledge council member Oswald Feliz, we're in his district. Um, so we're before you now and we are looking forward to getting your support um, and the city council's support uh, for this really important project um, and are very happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can you uh, discuss your plans for uh, local hiring or uh, MWBE participation uh, during construction and in terms of jobs uh, that would be available on site once construction is complete? I'll let uh, Susan answer that question, but just want to point out that Goldman Harris too is a WBE. My yeah, thanks, Gary. So we have not engaged a uh, general contractor as of yet. Um, we're hoping to do that uh, fairly soon after the rezoning as we get into more detailed uh, architectural drawings. But we are committed to, um, to local hiring and to MWBE, and certainly our financing will require that as well. I know uh, on our most recent job that we have um, at St. Philip Neary, it's a brand new construction project up in Bedford Park. I believe it's, it's at least 40% MWBE in terms of, of contractors. And in terms of local hiring, the way that we've the way that we've worked it on our other jobs, like at Second Farms, is we asked the uh, the general contractor to um, to commit to using uh, local hiring and and interviewing local groups and helping to provide training. Great, thank you. Um, I know you touched upon this a little bit in the presentation. Um, I'm not sure if I'm, I might have missed it, but what kind of programs will be offered on site uh, for supportive housing residents with mental health uh, or substance abuse issues? 
I'm going to ask Harold Moss, who's the, um, the director of uh, Catholic Charities, speaking of hope, to respond to that. Good morning. So we will have 70 individuals with a history of homelessness and serious mental illness. Some of those folks will have histories of substance use as well as forensic backgrounds. And the idea there for services is to provide ongoing case management services throughout their stay, which include individual and group activities, on-site activities, and off-site activities and to document all those services. Part of our role is to ensure that those folks are connected to the services that they need uh, with providers in the local community. Thank you. Um, and what kind of programs will be offered on site for residents that are aging out of foster care? I'm gonna ask our, our uh, New York family, um, I believe either Shannon or Jill. Shannon, oh, there you are. Shannon, you're muted. I guess you have to unmute Shannon. <laughs> Can you do that, uh, Andrew? Thank you. Okay. So you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Is it working? Oh, there you go. Okay, good. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Sorry. Not that working. Um, thank you for having us. Um, so Jill Gentile and I uh, are working closely to both share um, staff. Um, we'll have uh, individuals with developmental disabilities as well as those aging out of foster care, but we're working to kind of have a cohesive kind of pattern and group and, and programs for those, uh, for the, all of our residents in the New York family, but for the foster care folks specifically, um, we are looking at sustainability is the theme. So we want to provide support, but we also want to support them in thinking about the future and, and becoming sustainable, um, not requiring our assistance long term. So we um, are proposing to, again, similar to um, Beacon of Hope, take a case management approach, but um, a very focused case management approach, providing uh, a program called Mobility Mentoring which is it helps uh, residents create individual service plans with a focus of um, financial sustainability, sustainability, um, and uh, then also on site for anyone who um, has any mental health needs. We as an agency provide a lot of behavioral health, both substance use and mental health uh, on site in their apartments, um, should they want that. Uh, so it would be um, community home-based for them. Um, again, it kind of individualized by their need um, so nothing is mandated, but we are going to work hard to create community and attachment to our to our programs and our directors and, and people who will be on site um, so that they can build a service plan that, that works for them to really, again, goal is sustainability um, um, for their own lives. I can drill down and be more specific you like, but the main kind of overarching uh, case management is mobility mentoring. That's great. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. So... Uh, can we go back to slide 16 or, you know, actually don't have to go back. I'm just going to ask this question. It might have been there, but, you know, I talked to Council Member Felice and I know he's he's also very um, uh, concerned about uh, the uh, affordable housing units and the AMIs. Um, will the affordable uh, uh, households with incomes that were 40 to 70 percent AMI, um, can you provide a little bit more detail on the distribution here, for example, how many units will be offered at 40% AMI level? Yeah, so, um, oh, actually, I'll have to get that for you. I don't have that full breakdown uh, in I terms of which, information. Oh, you do have it, Tim? Okay, yeah, Tim yes, Collins, our financial advisor, has that. Do you want to talk about Tim? Yes, uh, so at the 40% AMI level, uh, there is a plan to have three studios, three one bedrooms, three two bedrooms, and three three bedroom units available. Um, and at the 50% level, the same unit uh, breakdown. So three uh, units for studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and three bedrooms. So a uh, total of 12 units available for 40% AMI, 50% AMI. And then at the 60% AMI band, uh, there's gonna be a total of 95 units available. 14 of those will be studios, 19 will be one bedrooms, uh, 32 two bedrooms, and 33 bedroom units. Okay. And then at the seven. A copy of that breakdown? Yes, yeah. uh, I, I can circulate that to the group. Absolutely. Great. 
Thank, thank you so much. And my last question uh, here is, uh, uh, what kinds of security measures will be in place to ensure the safety of the uh, development uh, residents and the community? I'm gonna ask Harold Moss to address that from Beacon of Hope. Sure, so um, in addition to having security cameras in and around the entire uh, site, we will also have a front desk staff stationed at uh, the building entry, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And those staff will be available to everyone in the building. Uh, that includes the Beacon of Hope residents, the New York family residents, as well as all of the community tenants to ensure that any questions they have, any needs they have can be addressed 24 hours a day. We'll also have staff uh, walk the building, particularly on the overnight shifts, just to make things sure, sure things are quiet, as well as view the external cameras as well to ensure the community is uh, safe and quiet. Okay, uh, great. That's uh, all the questions uh, that I have. I'm going to turn it over to our council to see if we have any council members who have any questions. I wanted to add one other point to the security. Um, the uh, center entrance also enables uh, keep the different populations from going into each other's respective portions of the building. So uh, if you're living in the Beacon of Hope side, you wouldn't have access to the New York Foundlings, Foundlings side. Uh, upstairs, although there are shared areas, for example, in the uh, in the garden would be shared. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So now I'm going to just turn it over to our council to see if we have any council members with questions. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, no, Chair. I see no members with. Uh, questions or hands or hands raised at this time. Okay. Well, there being no further questions, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, Thank you. Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the 1949 Bathgate Avenue proposal? Uh, if there are any members of the public who wish to testify on LUs 806 and 807, for the St. Joseph's 1949 Bathgate Avenue proposal, please press the raise hand button now. Chair Moya, the meeting will briefly stand at ease while we check for uh, any members of the public who may have registered. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chair Moya, I see no, sorry, I see no uh, members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Okay, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on LUs 806 and 807 for the St. Joseph's 1949 Bathgate Avenue proposal. The public hearing is now closed and this item is laid over. Uh, at this moment, I'd like to take a, a moment to recognize Council Member Levin. Um, and also um, have our council uh, take his vote. On a continuing vote of the land use items, council member Levin. I vote aye. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Chair, uh, by a vote of seven in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions, the items are approved and recommended to the full land use committee. Uh, and the vote is now closed. Thank you. And that concludes today's business. Uh, I will remind the viewing public that for anyone wishing to submit written testimony for items that were heard 
today, please send it uh, by email to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. I would like to thank the members of the public, uh, my colleagues, the subcommittee council, land use, and our council staff, and of course the sergeant at arms for participating in today's meeting. Uh, this meeting is hereby uh, adjourned. Thank you.